Kia ora whanau. how's it going? Welcome back to Word on Monday. Uh, we are carrying on with our series on the book of Revelation. Um, and we are picking up on a part two of what I talked about last week. We are at the third message to the churches, the message that Jesus effectively he's done um, seven letters to the churches even though they're speaking to individual churches of the day and time um, of of um, uh, of John um, collectively they were probably messages that went around um, as a kind of like a, a library of letters that moved around uh, Asia at the time so on one hand they were speaking to a particular grouping of people and a congregation and it's in, in a city and then on the other hand they're actually speaking to to the to the whole church and the, the christian uh, community of the day and like how we've uh, already talked about um, in our time together um, some see these as uh, each church represents an era within the church age um, and um, they they talk about that we're in the, the last um the last uh, period of the church of Laodicea where things have got so bad within the church community that actually God is standing or Jesus is standing outside the church and knocking on the door to be invited in. Um, uh, these are all all ways of approaching approaching revelation um, and um, it would be wise for us to consider the different nuances and the different ways that uh, people have interpreted scripture and particularly revelation in the past because it just helps us to give us some insight um, and then hopefully through the empowering of the holy spirit and discernment um, you'll be able to find what the lord is saying to you in relationship to the messages that he's that he's giving us here so there are some specific things that that point very pointedly to a church community of the day and time and so the original hearers of this word, they would know the typology, they would know the symbolism, they would know the, um, the imagery that uh, John's getting across and the things that he's seeing, and particularly with regards to this pro um, prophetic uh, literature. Um, the Hebrew people that were listening and um, those in the, in the synagogues would have understood uh, more than what we do today because it's not really something that we follow much in our, our kind of a Western tradition, which tends to be more scientific based um, and rational based as opposed to um, prophetic and spirit led per se. Yeah, I think you get what I'm when I'm getting at. So we do we do have we do have difficulties in understanding what this type of literature means for us. Um, but so far, uh, we actually haven't had too much of a difficulty relationship to the types of things we've come across. Um, the symbolism and the imagery are, are pretty easy. It's when we get in from chapter 4 onwards that it gets getting, getting a bit different, uh, difficult. Um, last week, we talked about uh, the church at uh, Thyatira, where um, um, Jesus uh, reveals himself and they're saying that this is, it's actually the Son of God that's giving this word, that's giving this message to the church, unlike the previous messages. Um, here we see, we talked about the, the eyes like um, burning fire. Um, we've got uh, feet that are, are burnished bronze. And, and now we're getting into um, the thing that Jesus says, the thing that I have against you from verses 20 onwards um, and again like he had done in the past he, he exhorted the church and saying I've seen the things you've done um, the things that you've persevered in the good stuff and all that type of thing he he, he puts the good news first before his, the kind of the bad news and in this case here we get into um, the, 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 the challenge that he gives the church and let's read together from uh, 20, verse 20 onwards Nevertheless I, have this, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her, her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I'll cast her on a bed of suffering, and I'll make those who commit adultery with her 
suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I'll strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches the hearts and minds, and I will pay each of you according to your deeds. Now, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, you to, you, to you who do not hold to a teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I'll not impose any other burden upon you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To them who overcome and does, not, and does my will to the end, I'll give authority over nations. They will rule with them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I received authority from my father, I'll also give him the morning star. They who have an ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Before we, we get into this character that we see here, can I just remind us that in verses 23 and 24, that part of this, those two verses kind of tie to the opening verses that we talked about last week in regards to the the the, the fire that's coming out of Jesus' eyes and the feet that are like burnished, uh, burns um, bronze. That it's it's um, it's it's hot. Um, it's it's pure. Um, and if if those two things were in a dream, and I talked about this last time, um, the feet are about your walk. Um, the gospel of peace. They're ready to proclaim the, the gospel of peace. Um, and uh, here is Jesus challenging um, someone's walk. Um, they're not walking right. They're not walking true uh, to the call that God has called them. And um, he talks about here that he's able to to pierce into our hearts. You know, he, he pierces into, he sees all things. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds and will repay each other according to their deeds. Now, um, this part here is, can be a little bit problematic for us because we, we, we come from a tradition where faith is not done by works. And so this has been a, a direct challenge to some of the Catholic traditions that, that have, have come across, um, things like um, um, economics, they would... For purgatory, uh, they worked out a, an economic system where you could pray for the salvation of those who were already dead, and so you would you would pay a tithe to do that. And so there was this, this whole economic system that that grew up around in that in that particular period of time, um, of where um, some of the, the the movements of like Martin Luther and, and others in the in the kind of Reformation period started to question some of the practices that the Pope had started um, doing and, and the Cardinals and all that in relationship to um, either buying indulgences or, or buying uh, prayers uh, or even paying for salvation for people. Um, and so as a, as a direct challenge to that, you see in the Reformation period um, that we're only justified through faith, and that's that's Paul's big discourse, discourse in Romans that the just are justified by faith. Now, um, verses like this, verses like in uh, in the chapter book of James and other parts, there we see there is a correlation between someone's faith and what they do, and um, through the seven letters to the churches, this, this seems to be accentuated, this seems to be heightened more, where Jesus is addressing the character and the actions of his people. Um, and to the point where he's saying that I'm going to judge what you do. And so there is this, this illusion or this, this challenge to us that our works or our actions do matter. Um, firstly, Jesus, he discerns and looks into the heart of people and he's, he's 
he knows all things, as I mentioned last week. He, he knows what's going on inside of us. And in that revelation of knowing us, um, he searches our hearts and minds. In other words, he searches our, our, our motivations. He searches the, the, the agenda behind what we're doing. And, he's, and this is where he's judging that. So yeah, this is this is something that's um, I, I needed to make sure I bring up is that um, we are going to be judged on what we do with the revelation that Jesus gives us uh, as a church community, uh, as a people, and um, I will repay. This is verse twenty three. I will pay each of you according to your deeds. We see this a little bit also in the Gospels where um, the, the, the parable, the talents and the gifts that God gives us. And um, we, we, when, when Jesus returns, um, the, there is a question about what have we done with those things, those gifts and talents that God has given, given to us. In other words, he's calling to us an account. Now, um, it's not that our works save us. It's not that our actions save us. But it seems like there needs to be fruit that's in line with the inner transformation that God has done with us, both individually and as, in a, as a community. There seems to be a, a call that as you grow in your faith, as you turn to, more, to be more like Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to transform us and renew us, uh, and to grow the gifts of the Holy Spirit inside of our lives, we then in turn will do our deeds will reflect that. And um, uh, this is this is confirmed by the statement that we this recurring theme that we have through the letters. And you'll see these often uh, in the parables that Jesus says. You know, um, in in the original context, is he who has an ear to hear. Um, that that idea is that the hearing, the flip side of the hearing is the doing. There's a direct correlation between your hearing and your ears affects your action, so that our walk has to be right. Um, and so this this idea of integrity. Um, I heard one person talk about integrity. Integrity is the ability to be integrated. You're integrated with uh, the values and the sets and the, 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 the things that, that, that you live by is integrated into your life. In other words, that it comes out in your walk or it comes out in your character, it comes out in your, your vocabulary, it comes out in your thought patterns and, and, and expressions of what, 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 how your walk is. And so part of the idea of seeing this, this burnished feet of bronze um, is that our walk conforms to the lifestyle and the pattern that Jesus is calling us to. Now, why is this important? Because we come back to the character um, that we we see here uh, in verses 20 through to, to, to 22. And this is the character that is labeled, you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Now, um, Let's kind of unpack this a little bit in a, in a bit of a layer. Firstly, uh, Jesus has revealed someone in the church of Thyatira um, is in leadership, has some sort of influence. Um, what they have done is that they've led the people astray into sexual immorality and eating uh, meat to, that have been sacrificed to idols. So there are two things that, that that's happened. Um, sexual immorality and eating meat sacrificed to, to idols. <clears throat> so there's the challenge about don't get caught up in that. Um, but as I mentioned last time, the key factor that um, Jesus is raising here is not necessarily, although it's wrong and it's not a right walk and, and he's telling the people don't get caught up in that, um, he is calling her to repentance. Uh, this character that is labelled um, the woman Jezebel is not repenting. And in so doing, her followers are not repenting. And so there is a call to repentance. There's a call to repentance to get back onto the right walk. Um, and 
um, this is the th this is one of the messages of this this particular passage here to the church. This is one of the revelations, is that despite what you and I do, we are going to stuff up at times and we're going to mess up at times. Um, but there's always a place of repentance. There's a place of repentance before our Heavenly Father, before the throne of grace, before Jesus, that we ask the Holy Spirit to come back and cleanse us. We ask the, the, the blood of Jesus to restore us back into a right relationship, back into a right walk. Let the eyes of Jesus fall upon us and say, Lord, is there anything in my life that's not right with you? And then repent. So um, the, the first part of it is that repentance is open to anybody and everybody. Um, and as I said before, if the serpent is saying to you, oh, you need to get right before you, you can come before the Father, or you need to get right before you come into the church, um, that's a lie. The lie of the serpent is that you have to sort yourself out. Uh, you have to sort out your own stuff. That's the works part that I was talking about earlier. If you think that I, I have to be okay, I have to be perfect, I have to have the right clothing on, I have to be clean, um, I, I need to sort out my S, some people say, um, that's really coming from the pits of hell. That's, that's a serpent's lie. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to set yourself up to make yourself right. In other words, it's, it's fleshly effort to try to please yourself, to try to make God happy with you. Far from it. Jesus just calls us to repentance, whatever we've done. Now, let's have a look at this character. Um, Jezebel, um, if you've read scripture and you know about it, um, you would straight away, you would think of the prophet Elijah, you would think of Israel um, following the idols and the, the religious systems of the, the Canaanites around them, um, you would you would you would see a whole lot of uh, imagery of um, uh, Elijah praying for fire to come down from heaven to consume up the altars. You know you have this direct challenge between the prophets of Baal, of which was the Jezebite uh, religion. Uh, so Je uh, so Jezebel, who influenced King the King Ahab, and they eventually brought in. The Baal worship into into Israel, the people of God, um, and so the Canaanite religion, the Canaanite philosophy, and and, and processes started to in, 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 infect um, the the people of Israel. Contrastly, Elijah and later along Elisha were raised as prophets to bring the people back to God, um, to 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 take away all those um, uh, pagan festivals, those pagan religious um, ceremonies. And the encounter was that there was this challenge between the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Yahweh, in other words, the person of Elijah. And so uh, once Elijah uh, and God answered his prayer, he prayed for fire to come down and consume the altar and consume the wood and consume the, the, the bulls, the sacrifice, consume all the water. Um, and then uh, the, the prophets of Baal were slaughtered. In the next scene, you see Elijah running away into the caves and hiding because Jezebel wanted his head. She said, um, kill him. I want his head. Now, <clears throat> the Jezebel image um, is where the person who's exhibiting the spirit or the, the, the aspirations of Jezebel uh, wants to rule through a king. And so in this case, she had married a king, the king of um, Israel at the time, the people of, of God, and she was ruling through him. Um, so on the first instance, the Jezebel spirit seeks places of authority to speak out into things. Um, now, they will do things in a way that will quite try to control leadership, uh, will try to control the environment of the, the things that come out of that leadership body or leadership group. Um, they will could try to control a, a people groups um, and have their systems set up. It's all about their, their systems and processes. Um, now, 
although it's identified that in this case here, this 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 woman Jezebel, um, the male alternative to that um, is Absalom. Uh, Absalom was, as we know, was one of the sons of David, and when there was a dispute between the household of David and who would take over um, or who would rule um, the people of God, um, you see Absalom um, rise up and try to take David's throne by force. Um, and so when you think about this character, uh, you kind of need to see those two together. Jezebel and Absalom are, are things that work against, ultimately, the fruits of the Spirit. Um, if you listen long enough, you can hear the way someone speaks and talks of what spirit they come from. Um, and so anybody can have a, a spirit of either Jezebel or Absalom and, and this, this process that's going on here. So when someone is identified, or and this is a pretty, it's a pretty hard hitting um, punch that that Jesus is doing here. He's not missing words. He's being pretty serious. To label someone, oh that woman Jezebel, um, uh, there's no grace in that. He's being very specific about the type of spirit that this this woman is is functioning in the church, uh, to the point that she's leading leading them astray. Um, into into sexual immorality and, and, and into uh, eating food offered to to idols. Um, so he's being pretty pretty straight. He's hitting straight in the eyes. If I was had a tire and I was going to do a, a strike, it would be straight to the eyes. And that's what he's doing. He's he's being very clear that there's someone in the leadership, and this someone is reflecting this person in the past. And we know that in the past we see that um, eventually. Jezebel um, gets fed to the dogs. She gets thrown off because she leads. It gets so bad um, that the people rise up against her, and God moves through um, and throw, she gets thrown off off the building, and the dogs eat her up. And it's a, it's it's a it's a terrible situation that it gets to. That's why I mentioned the repentance part at the start. Here is the grace of God. Here is the mercy and the grace of Jesus for you and I today. That sometimes we may function in our flesh, that we may be overrun by our fleshly desires. Um, there's a challenge going on in our society today, and I think it's one of the spirits that's happening amongst us, is pride. All the things that we see on the news and we've seen up in our street in regards to our shootings that we've had here in Kaikwe, it comes back to pride. People are too pride up, too proud, to either say they're wrong. I've, 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 I've been in some organisations recently where uh, the leadership, uh, even when they were wrong, they carried on down the track of what they decision they'd made. They were too proud to say I made a mistake, because they th they thought it might affect their career. Um, it might it might affect where they get an extension to their career, um, and um, we see we see this in, in organisations in regards to the service industry. Yeah, I, and I call this uh, professional egos. We have professional egos within different disciplines where they they're so adamant that they've got all the answers that they're not will, listen, willing to listen across the table. It's all pride. It's, it can be professional pride, it can be tribal pride, it can be social pride, it can be intellectual pride, it can be trade pride. Um, pride destroys relationships. And, the, and the, the lesson that we get here with the actions of Jezebel, although wrong, it's actually the message of repentance that Jesus is calling their people to. Firstly, to her, he's calling her to repentance, and if she doesn't repent, she'll die. And so too that those that follow you. This call that, that Jesus in the midst of searching our hearts and minds, he calls us to repentance. The state of pride doesn't have to be like that. We can say we're sorry. Um, Jesus is about bringing healing and reconciliation to relationships. And this is what this message is about today. It's a message for the church. We need to heal our relationships. Put down your pride. 
What's the antidote to pride? It's humility. It's humility in our conduct. It's a humility in our thought. It's, a, it's humility when we come to the business table when we're listening to people. This is where the real diversity comes. Uh, it's not about whether you have 50% male or 50% woman and all this type of stuff. Humility actually comes when you're sitting at the business table and you're able to hear the voices of those that are around you and are able to make a decision. Um, it's the ability to to be in a relationship with your husband or wife, and if you're you're in a in a in a in a in a impasse where you can't work through something, it's the it's the humility to be able to listen and to hear the concerns of the other person, um, and and try to find a way of moving forward, um, a resolution to whatever's been presented to you. Uh, it's the humility that when when someone is probing you and 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 jabbing you and and you start to feel your emotions of anger coming up. It's taking time to go, hang on a minute, I'm reacting in a way that's not actually helpful or it's not holy or it's not it's not reflecting what Jesus would do. Um, take a pause. Take a time out. Um, think about how do I de-escalate this? This emotion that's going on, this, this anger, how do I de-escalate that anger? How do I de-escalate that, that that's going into the red zone? Um, how do I de-escalate it? What are the triggers that might might feed uh, my responses in a particular way? Relationships and the restoration of relationships is what Jesus is about. Jesus is the model of the love of God. And, um, you know, people have been saying, oh, there's terrible things going on in our town and so forth. And it's just, it's broken relationships. And the pride that comes with people that are not willing to say, I'm sorry whether it's a, a, a father to their son or daughter, whether it's a, a husband to the wife or the wife to the husband or grandparents to their children and whatever it is, situation. Humility and repentance is the starting block to healing. It's the starting steps, it's those first steps to healing relationships and restoration. Fano, you and I cannot live in a world where we live by pride. Um, it destroys relationships. It breaks relationships down. And even though um, Jezebel and those that were following were being led astray by the spirit of Jezebel, there was the opportunity to repent. There was the opportunity to come back to the Father. When the father calls out to Adam in the garden, there was this opportunity for Adam and Eve to repent and um, admit what they had done. And yet still, God wanted to engage with Adam and Eve in that garden scene. And it's the same here. Jesus is calling us to repent when we fall, when we miss the mark. When there are things in our lives that shouldn't be there, he calls us to repent. And that repentance, even though it's an in-house word, is really coming before those who you've hurt and saying, I'm sorry. Or coming to God and saying, Father, I didn't really live up to what you wanted me to do today. I'm sorry. Can you help me? Can you renew your spirit in me and make me new again? Jesus, God, they love the posture of humility. Coming with humility before our Heavenly Father is the thing that he loves. He loves a heart that seeks after him. He loves a heart and a life that seeks after him. And that's what we need in our homes, in our communities, and in our families. So may we be warned, far note, by this story to the church of Thyatira. And not be like the woman of Jezebel or those that followed her and not be willing to repent. Swallow your pride and come before Jesus and say, I'm sorry. Hoiana Farno, you've been watching um, Lewai Takahu here. Um, 
on our Word for Word on Monday. Um, click the uh, like button, share it on around, and um, I pray that you have a great week. And um, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. God bless.